welcome to 1122 Online. We're grateful you decided to join us as we come together to make much of Jesus through worship and word. If you're new here, we're excited to have you with us. And if you're returning, welcome back. That's right, welcome back. We are one church in many locations, seeking to discover and deepen our relationship with Jesus while encouraging others to do the same. That's right. Today, we're in a series titled Be Free, a study of Galatians. Paul sets the stage by emphasizing the source of his authority and the central theme of his message, freedom in Christ. That's right, Paul highlights the redemptive work of Christ as the cornerstone of our freedom. Christ is the source of true freedom. Our freedom in Christ is not a license to indulge in sin by no means, as Paul would say it, but a call to holy living, guided by the Spirit's transformative work within us. So as we journey through the scriptures and discover the various aspects of freedom found in our Lord Jesus Christ, we also wanna encourage you to visit us on YouTube where you can join us for live services, stay current on the series, rewatch previous sermons, and indulge in other on-demand content like the Deepen Podcast with Pastor Joe Lee Martin. As we embark on this journey through the book of Galatians, may we fix our gaze upon the liberating truth of the gospel, the truth that in Christ we are free indeed. Let us embrace this freedom with grateful hearts, walking in the light of His grace and extending His love to a world yearning for release from the chains of sin and death. From whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Now let's worship together right now. Good evening, church family. Welcome to the Church of 1122. We want to invite you to enter into a time of worship with us tonight. As we lift high our God and King, He is the only one worthy, amen. Come on, let's sing it out together. If the darkness hides before the King, why should my heart fear the enemy? He is defeated. If you spoke the universe to be, you can crush this mountain at my feet. My God is able, my God is able. With one voice we declare, I believe that you are my victory. The Sing it out together. 
my king will reign forever he's fighting every battle there is no power like the risen jesus my king will reign forever he's fighting every battle there is surface become possible through the power of Jesus. Amen. We're going to introduce a new song tonight. It's called The Lamb, the Lion, the King. And in Revelation 5, 5, it reads this. Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And if you read down a little further, verse 12, it says, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Notice the significance that Jesus is both the spotless lamb who was slain to cover the sins of the earth, and he's also the triumphant lion of Judah who reigns forevermore. Only Jesus, he's the king of kings and he sits at the right hand of his father. And we're just gonna worship him for all that he's been to us and all that he will continue to faithfully be. The chorus goes like this. You are and you always will be the savior of the world who gave everything to me. The one all of heaven calls worthy. The lamb, the lion, the king.
There's no other name that has the power to save. You are the king of our salvation, Lord. We look to you. We lean on you. God, I pray that you would hear the songs of our heart overflow in gratitude for all that you've done on the cross. Lord, I pray if there's anything in us on this platform or in this room that is bringing a spirit of religion, I'm going to try to earn my way to your affection. I pray you break it in the name of Jesus. I pray that we would just be filled with the fullness of Scripture, that you fulfilled all of those things. You ascended the hill of the Lord. You walked out everything for our sake so that we can walk into any place. We can go in any place in the world, and when two or three or more gather together, Lord, you are in their midst. You are here right now in your church breathing, living, and active. You're sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord, and we look to you. Would your spirit come and rest in us and breathe freedom into our hearts? Would freedom reign in this place? In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory, all the honor, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. Good evening, and welcome to the Church of 1122. It's a joy to get to worship with you guys, our holy King above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Every time we sing that song, I think about how great 
our God is. And it's a joy to get to sing it with all of you here in this room and to worship with all of you who are joining us online. At the Church of 1122, we seek to glorify God by making disciple, making disciples. Have you caught that? We want to pour our lives into men and women who will be disciples, who make disciple making disciples. It's a multiplication thing. And we want to help you do that. And one of the ways that we want to help you do that is through an app. We have an 1122 app. We just launched a brand new version of it on Monday, and it is full of tons of resources to help you do what God has called you to do, which is to make disciple making disciples. There's tons of things on that app, like the sermons are all on there, the Deepen podcast is on there, the disciple group curriculum is on there, you can give on there. All of that is designed to help you do the thing that God made you to do, but there's so much more. We prayed and worked through creating this where there's even a daily portion on there to help you grow in your walk with God, where you can have our reading plan is on there, you can put prayer requests in. We wanna help you do the thing that God has made you to do. So you can download that wherever you download apps and you can follow the process that's clear to walk through to get that it's an incredible tool that I hope will help you in your walk with God we're in a series called be free we started last week through the book of Galatians and we decided one of the things we wanted to do in this series was read emails that have been sent in that are testimonies of how God has set some of us free and the email I want to read to you tonight is from Kyle in Indiana Kyle says, I started my walk with Christ around a year ago. I wholeheartedly believe Jesus saved me from suicide. After my divorce and not seeing my little boy, and Kyle puts in parentheses, ain't no pain like kid pain. That's a fact. He said, I struggled with life. Kyle was walking through a very difficult situation. He was doing anything he could to cope with the pain. And Kyle got to a point where he felt like God was too far from him, that he had sinned too much. And thank God for a friend that reached out to Kyle. And Kyle says, I believe that that was the work of our Heavenly Father, that friend reaching out, telling me that he wasn't done with me. That's where my faith and my walk began. Now, I truly believe Jesus died on the cross for me and saved me that night. And he did. Kyle, we're so thankful for that friend. We're so thankful for what he's doing in your life. Listen, if you're here in this room, you're watching online and suicide is a thought for you, please know that that is not for you. That God is the author of life. He has life abundantly for you and we wanna be a part of that. Please text the word CARE to 441122 or don't leave this place without grabbing one of us and letting us pray for you and walk with you. Right now, we're gonna continue to worship by hearing Connie's testimony. So grab a Bible, grab a pen and something to write on. And let's hear from Connie. I grew up in the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses do believe that Jesus did come and die. However, apparently it wasn't enough. So they had to supplement what Jesus did with these good works. And that's why they were so important. From the time I was in a stroller, I was going door to door. Um, you had to attend three services a week, a theocratic ministry school to teach you how to reach people. You know, I was fine until I became 19. I had dated and I made a series of really poor decisions and I sinned. I went to my father, he was there. There was no judgment, there was just nothing but love. And at the end, as an elder in the local congregation, he knew and I knew that I had an obligation to go before the elders and confess my sin. There were 12 men and me at 19, and the options were to confess and repent or to be disfellowshipped. I questioned that several times, like, why do I have to go before these 12 men? They don't know me. I turned the tables on those 12 men we debated the questions that I had been riddled with my entire teen years. And that is, how can I have an imperfect father who shows more love than the God that you talk about as Jehovah God? You answer my questions, I will repent and confess. You don't answer my questions, I will disassociate myself from the organization. I was excommunicated. I wanted nothing to do that was going to filter God's love through rules. 
Fortunately, I had an aunt who prayed faithfully for those 13 years for me to find Jesus. And then a friend of mine, she got a postcard in the mail for a non-denominational church. And we decided we would go. I sat there and the message was Jesus, the Lamb of God. It was just about, He loves me. He loves me. I had been searching for that love my entire life. And I thought, there it is, that's the peace, that's the love that I've never seen that I never experienced, that when I needed it, it wasn't there because it didn't fit the rules. That was it, that was it. I surrendered my life and became a Christian. And in 2015, God called me to 1122. The following September was saturated and Pastor Kwan was preaching that night. And at the end of his message, he said, I want everybody just to sit and ask the Holy Spirit for a word. And the Holy Spirit's like, your word is freedom. I now am free to go running to Jesus every day. What was missing before was I didn't have a relationship with my Savior. And because of that personal relationship, it's not just about going to heaven. It's about, oh my goodness, you loved me so much, me that you hung on that cross. And that's no longer a means to eternity. That's love. Jesus transformed my life from surviving to living a free and abundant life to help those that are hurting. Now he is preparing me to bring equine therapy for emotionally broken and hurting women. I know that no matter what situation I walk into, he's right here. And so I might be nervous, but I'm not fearful because this God who came down to earth and died for me is never going to forsake me. He's always there. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Sometimes I think the testimony videos are better than the sermon. That was true tonight. Miss Connie sitting right here on the front row. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Ms. Connie's also the mother of one of my favorite 1122ers. Not that you have favorites, except Michael, you're one of my favorites. Michael is one of our special needs VIPs, guys. He leads worship from the front row every single week. Way to go, man, love you, buddy. Hey, listen, um, <clears throat> if you've ever been beaten up, battered, or bruised by a church or somebody claiming to speak on behalf of God, and uh, I'm sorry. Amen. And I am glad that you are here. This is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the thing I would encourage you, please don't walk away from Jesus because you had a bad experience with religious people. Jesus had bad experiences with the religious people all the time, amen? amen. All right, grab your Bibles. We're gonna be in Galatians chapter one. This is a 14 week study on the book of Galatians, which is, I love when we do this. It's only this big in my Bible, okay? And all your 20 year olds, it's only that big because I use the extra large print, so huh, whatever, all right? We've got some Galatian journals out in the resource center. It's a cool way to get it because it's just one page is the Bible, the other page is a place to take notes. I'd encourage you to do that. And uh, you know I love you. This one might sting a little, okay? But it's from love, I promise. So buckle up. Paul says this in Galatians 1, 6. He says, I am astonished. Can you imagine getting a letter like this? Now, Pastor Adam let us know that this is the only letter that Paul writes where there is not a prayer and a little thanksgiving part. Every other letter, like, in, like to the letter to, to, the, to the church at Philippi, he's like, I pray for you day and night. I long to see you again. I remember our tears. This one, he's like, what's up, Galatians? Paul, I am astonished. That ain't good, okay? If this is a text, it's in all caps. You understand what I'm saying? He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That word is anathema. It means damned to hell. That's pretty extreme. As we have said before, when did you say it? The sentence before this. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed, damned to hell. Even if an angel shows up and says, whoa, 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 it's Jesus plus this. Paul says, angel, you can go to hell. It's pretty extreme. So the reason I point this out is because what we are talking about in our time together is life or death. And it's actually bigger than that. It's eternal life or death. So Paul goes on a missionary journey. He and some of his boys share the gospel in this area of Galatia. A bunch of churches, people get saved. They anoint and appoint some elders and pastors. They start, they start church and then they start planting churches. And within a year, he is astonished that they're turning away and believing something other than the gospel. So first and foremost, let's unpack the gospel. If you're gonna be an 1122 or you gotta know the gospel. And if you're like, well, it seems like you go over it every week. That's right, every week. The gospel means good news of salvation. It comes from a Greek word where when a king would defeat another army, he would send an evangelist, is what they're called, a giver of the good news, and they would show up to a society and say, I've got good news. Your king has defeated the enemy, and now grace and peace be unto you because of what your king has done. That's what the gospel is, it's good news. It is not good advice for you to live a decent life. That is not what it is. Gospel from 30,000 feet is simply this. Man, you could, you could understand your whole Bible with these three words, God with us. That's it, God with us. At creation, God creates Adam and Eve, humankind, to be in right relationship with him, God with us. Sin enters the world, it fractures that. So God sins, sets up the law, we'll talk a lot about the law, sets up the sacrificial system so that blood could be shed for the covering of sin so that he could be in the presence of his people. But it wasn't enough that the law was a map and a mirror. The law was a map to show us how to rightly live with a holy God, but it's also a mirror to be like, this is impossible, I can't pull this off, right? And so Jesus Christ comes on a rescue mission and he lives the perfect life that none of us could. He keeps every law, he fulfills every promise and prophecy of the old covenant. He goes to the cross and he dies not just for you but instead of you. He pays the full price for our sin debt and at the cross pushes up on his nail pierced feet and says it is finished to tell us that paid in full. And for anyone who believes that when Christ died on the cross, it counted for them, we get credited with his righteous, perfect life and adopted into the family of God, and he takes the full payment for our sin. And then there will come a day where either we die or he returns to get us, and we will be with him forever and ever and ever in the consummation of all things God with us. Amen. And what makes heaven heaven is not streets of gold and plenty to eat. What makes heaven of heaven is we get him. Paul describes the gospel this way, 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. This is what we have to do to the church. I don't know if you know this, church people forget stuff, a lot. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then here's what he's gonna tell them. He says, this is the gospel, for I delivered you to you as of first importance. This means the gospel is the most important thing that you can preach about. That I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, as Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. You know why he says this? If he's like, if you don't believe me, just go, kick around Jerusalem and you'll meet some people that met him face to face. Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So what is the gospel? The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in accordance with the scriptures. Nothing else. Are there implications? There are so many implications, like the way we treat each other, 
what we do for people in need, all of those are implications of the gospel, but that is not the gospel. The gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans, all you Baptists are gonna love this. Remember the Romans Road? All you gigglers just gave yourself away. All right? It's like the four holy hops to heaven. They're all true. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Keith, fall short is an archery term. I go bow hunting with this guy because he has access to a lot of land. So he's my second favorite right behind you, Michael. It's you, landowners, okay? So it means, fall, it means miss the mark. What it takes to get to heaven is a perfect shot every time. And sin is when we miss the mark. Even if we could make it a perfect shot from here on, which we can't, what are we gonna do about the ones we have missed previously? That's what sin is. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, but for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So what you earn, so we live in a, we live in a world right now, especially America, this makes me wanna go crazy. I'm appalled when people are like, that's not fair. You know what fair is? You burn in hell. Selah, that's what fair is. Why? Because what you earn by your sin, the wages of sin, is death. But the free gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Not that we got our act together, then we earned a right standing before God, but even while we were yet still sinners, which is still right now, Christ demonstrated his love by saying, I'll go first. I'll die for you. Then Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what does it take to be saved? That's it. You believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's as simple as saying, Lord, save me, and you will be saved. That is what the gospel is. Now, he also has already done a abbreviated version of the gospel in what Pastor Adam preached last week. He says this in verses three and four, grace to you and peace from God. That is the result of the gospel. You want grace and peace, you get Jesus, you get grace and peace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's the gospel, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. That's the gospel. Not that we cleaned ourselves up, but that Jesus came on a rescue mission to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And I've told you this before, man. If you think you have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus, that's like waiting for the bleeding to stop before you go to the ER. You got it out of order. Also, if you're a longtime Christian, which some of you look like you were in Sunday school with Abraham, so I'm talking about me, man, okay? Did y'all see that video last week and they show young Joby? Yeah. I've aged like milk. Just chunky and white. That's me, all right? So it's terrible. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, no, I forgot. Oh, so if it's a little grimy around here, like if you get up from your seat to come and pray, I'd bring your purse at 1122. I just would, man. It might not be there when you get back, you understand? Because, but this, if you, walk into a, if you walk into an ER and you're like, there's an odor, you think? Well, that's what it's always gonna be here. Because we are inviting every single person, the beaten up and the broken, to come and be healed and rescued by Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is that he, he delivers us, he rescues us. And so you'll see here, Jesus does all of the acting. He is the one that initiates. We are the passive recipients of his righteousness and of his grace. So let's break down what he said. I'm only doing, what, four verses? Shouldn't take, it'll probably be like 15 minutes, then I'll be done, okay? <laughs> he says, I am astonished. Astonished. It's like, I can't believe this. He looks at these people that received the gospel and now they're trying to add works to it. Just so you know, in case you missed last week, what's happening here is there's a group of people called the Judaizers. These are Hebrew Christians, people that grew up Jewish, and they are saying to these Gentile Christians, Jesus isn't enough. 
you have to become Jewish before you can be a Christian. That they're particularly talking about circumcision, not for like a, not for like a medical reason, but because it is the sign of the covenant of God, God's promise for his people. And they're saying you have to take on this act, this obedience to the law in order to be a Christian. And Paul is like, what are you doing? I am astonished. The gospel is an offer of a free gift. Why in the world would you try to add your works to it? He says, I'm astonished that you were so quickly deserting, what's that next word? Him. Him. See, if you get your Bibles out, like I told you, you can look down and see, but you don't. You see, you're like, you didn't put it on the screen. Come on, man. <laughs> when you walk away from the scripture, when you walk away from the gospel, you're, you're walking away from Jesus. Please know that. You are deserting him. He says, I can't believe this. I'm astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you. Don't you remember when he called you? When you heard him call your name? When you believed and received the free gift? Listen, I know, I know it's very popular right now to deconstruct from your faith. But as I dig into folks that are deconstructing, what they're actually deconstructing from is like this kind of church culture, not the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know who doesn't deconstruct? Somebody that's tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Somebody that has known they're a wretched, black-hearted sinner and God is saving. Somebody that was blind and beaten up and broken and they met Jesus and they experienced grace and peace. You see, and notice here, it is God who calls you into his life. You don't call him into yours that he calls you and he says, I'm so astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. The only thing that we bring to our salvation is the sin that requires it, not the good works that you do. And he says, and you are turning to a different gospel. See that when you come to Christ, you turn away from this world, you turn away from yourself, you die to yourself, and you turn towards him. And he's warning the, the people in Galatia, hey, be very, very careful. If you begin to think that works in addition to your faith save you, you're actually turning your back on Jesus and you're turning back to yourself for your own salvation. And he says, so you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, that there, there is only one gospel. Amen. He's saying there's a distortion of the truth, that you were turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That they take a, like a lot of what people say is true, it's just not the whole truth, and they just twist it or distort it and just try to add to it a little bit. This word distortion literally means to reverse. They are reversing the truth of the gospel. And so it makes a ton of sense. You see, the order of our salvation matters like crazy. It's this, God calls, we receive and follow. It's not we act and God responds. This is very, very important. So the gospel is this, we obey because we are accepted, not the other way around. What the Judaizers were teaching is, is if you obey, then you will be accepted. See how the order matters like crazy? Or the way I say it all the time is this, identity precedes activity. Identity precedes activity. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then God adopts you as his son or his daughter and he says, I'm gonna tell you who you are. You are beloved, be loved by God. Your name is changed, your identity is changed and then because of that new identity, you act in a different way, why? Because you don't have to do the stuff you used to do because the old you is dead and you've been resurrected anew in Christ. What? What the Judaizers were doing, what people that were saying, well, it's faith plus some other things, is they got the order and they're like, no, 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 it's actually activity precedes identity. 
that God sends you a report, or sends you a test, and he's gonna wait and see how you do, and then he's gonna tell you whether you're in or whether you're out. And again, what they are doing in the first century is some Jewish leaders from Jerusalem come in and be like, hey, your faith is adorable, but you've also gotta be circumcised to follow Jesus. This is no gospel at all. Now, it's easy for us to pick on this one because it's not super applicable to us. Especially if you're grown, you're like, what? You gotta do what? Okay, it'd be weird. Like the new members class in the first century church, if this was the case, all women, no men. They're like, you know what? I think I'm gonna watch online. That's how that would've gone, so. (laughs) And what you gotta get around your mind here is that when these Jewish leaders were saying, no, you need to be circumcised, they were taking a really beautiful and good thing. It was God's symbol of his promise and his covenant for his people. But when you elevate a good thing to a salvific God thing, that's a really, really bad thing. Now, in today's day and age, this thing is still happening. There are modern day Judaizers that will say that faith in Christ is not enough, that there's some stuff that you have to do. And listen, if you get offended, you probably will. Just do me one favor. Only get offended for yourself. Like, just don't get offended for anybody else. Let them, they can email me, jimmycrackscorn at idontcare.com. I'll be happy to, and you know, that's not actually my email, okay? If you think it is, you're not gonna understand anything I'm talking about tonight anyway, so it don't matter. Okay, so it'll be like, so, what are we talking about? All right. Now, sometimes, like, recently, you may, be, you may bump into somebody or some people that are a, a part of organizations like Miss Connie was talking about that have taken a lot of truths from the Bible, but distorted and twisted them and added their own flavor to them, and it is no gospel at all. The Jehovah's Witnesses were started in 1872 by a guy named Charles Russell, okay? He had a hard time dealing with the doctrine of eternal hellfire. He didn't like it. So he dug in and In his studies, he denied not only eternal punishment, but he denied the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the Holy Spirit. So he started publishing his own newspaper, uh, magazines, now they're called the Watchtower. And the problem with it, though, was the Bible. So he just made his own version of the Bible to match his magazines. That's not a good way to do Bible study. Now, before we beat up on Charles, you and I do it every day of our life. There's what I want, there's what God says. You got one of two options. You can go, I don't like this, but you're my Lord, so I'm gonna submit and surrender to what you say, especially when I don't like it. You realize submission isn't submission until you disagree? It's just convenient up to that point, you know? All right, so anyway. So he starts, he made up his own Bible, and they teach that Jesus was created and not co-equal with the Father, They teach that faith alone does not save you, but works must be added. Now, let me tell you, if you're like, I know some Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're so nice. Dude, unless you get excommunicated, I know that was bad. Up to that point, if you're just an outsider, the nicest people you've ever met, the most loving, endearing, for sure, for sure. It's just not the gospel. It gets better. Joseph Smith, in 1823, September 21st, He's 17 years old, so you know he could be trusted because, man, there's no wisdom like a 17-year-old. His story is he was visited by an angel who was supposed to be the son of Mormon and the leader of the people called the Nephites who had lived in the Americas, and this angel appeared to him and told them that he had been translated because the Bible wasn't enough, so he wrote another book called the Book of Mormon. To, to, to fill in all the gaps where the church was wrong. And this book of Mormon was written on these golden plates and they were hidden where Joseph was living in New York. And he says on, on September 22nd, 1827, he received the plates and the angel instructed him to, to translate these plates. And it was finally published in 1830, it's called the Book of Mormon. Mormonism teaches that forgiveness of sin is obtained by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the Mormon church. Quote, this is from their doctrinal statement. One of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God, that belief in Jesus Christ alone is all that is needed for salvation. 
Yeah, that's Ephesians 2. I'm just telling you, okay? Now, if you were, so this is no gospel. And if he was to say, yeah, but an angel told me. That wasn't an angel. Paul says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, let him be damned to hell. There are fallen angels, we call those demons. And they come saying the most wonderful things. Because that's what they do, man. I mean, the devil dressed as an angel of light. That's what he tries to masquerade as. And so I think most of us are like, "Eh, I'm probably not gonna go down that road. But let me tell you the road that we have a tendency to go down. We allow our feelings or our experience to be the arbitrator of truth instead of the word of God. You know how you defang the word truth? Put a possessive pronoun in front of it. Well, this is my truth. No, no, no. That's just your opinion. Or it might be the pizza you ate last night, okay? There's just the truth. And the truth is not even just a set of statements. The truth is a person, his name is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he gives us his truth, which is the word of God. Now, it would be easy for me to pick on people outside of the Christian church, but why don't we just go through a little stroll through the Christian church? Get ready. You could try to attach your denomination to it if you would like. I don't know if you should do that or not. Maybe we'll name names on the podcast. <laughs> Be the most listened to one we've ever had. <clears throat> Fundamentalist legalism in the church is the same thing Paul is preaching against in Galatia. And this is that the grace of Jesus at the cross, faith alone is not enough. It's faith plus what you don't do. Now, I know this one well because I grew up in the South and I grew up in a Baptist church and they would never say this out loud. They would say at camp, all you gotta do is ask Jesus into your heart. Now, once again, you don't ask him into your life, he asks you into yours, but that's fine, that's fine. But then they would say, but if you're really a Christian, we didn't need all the 10 commandments. They said this, you don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. That's it. If you obey those commandments, then you can be saved. Now the trouble is, I'm from Dillon. So the crom queen was like, how y'all doing? You know what I'm saying? So, and if you don't know what that means, welcome from New York or wherever you moved here from. So, right. This is what I call beach ball theology. Like being a Christian is not sin management. Come on, we live at the beach. You ever try to take a beach ball? This is what many, many people taught. Many people, they would never say this explicitly, but the kind of churches, I didn't really go to church that much, but when I would go to the churches I went to, I would hear this message, God is good, you are bad, try harder, see you next week. And I just couldn't pull it off, man. I would try so hard for many days in a row. And it's like this kind of theology is like white knuckling your sin, that your job is to grab a hold of your sin like a beach ball and hold it under the water. Now, how long could you do that? Some people a little longer than others, you know? Like the swole guy on the front row, you probably do it for longer than Walker, okay, probably. (laughs) Eventually, what happens? Eventually, you get tired. Sunscreen gets on your fingers, gets a little slippery. A wave hits you in the face. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, but when you release it, it does not just gently rise back up. It explodes on you. And so many of us have tried to do that. Like I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna try to be a good Christian and I'm going to impress God by not doing these things. Now, we should be at war against sin, but if you try to do it in your own power and think God will be impressed if you pull it off, you're gonna be exhausted or prideful. Those are your options. The good news of the gospel is not that we hold the ball under the water. The good news of the gospel is Jesus walks by and pokes a hole in your beach ball. He takes all the power out of it because we trust in him, not our own ability. Now, the, the pendulum can swing all the way over to the other side and people believe in this cheap grace and think that, think that when we talk about freedom, that means you're free to do whatever you wanna do. That's no gospel at all. You see, if you think, well, I'm forgiven, so it doesn't matter, this is kind of that camp salvation theology. I kind of oscillated between these two for a long time because I would try to hold the beach ball under the water, I would screw up, and then I think, well, I'm, I'm messed up. 
but camp's coming in 11 months. And if I'm gonna be forgiven, I might as well give Jesus his money worth and go ahead and just load it up as big, like just fill up my sin bucket as big as I could because I knew at camp they were gonna have this moment where you could come and confess all your sins and he was faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so me and my buddies would come out there with our sin bucket and we would just dump it all down and not do anything different when we went home. Listen, if you think the gospel is that you get to do whatever you want, that's not the gospel. If you do whatever you want and you don't even care, then you are the Lord of your own life. Jesus is not your Lord. A part of surrendering your life to the Lordship of Christ. Are we gonna stumble and fall? For sure, but you better run to him because he offers forgiveness. But there's no way you can reject him and say, I do what I wanna do and say, I've put my faith in you. And so, there are two things that the Reformation really uncovered. The authority of the word of God and the reality that what the Bible teaches is that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so anytime you try to add works to your faith in order to earn your salvation, it is no gospel at all. And here's what's crazy, man. Every single one of us are suckers for it all the time. Amen. The only way, the only reason I can figure this out, me too, man, I'm a sucker for it too. I mean, I like to pick on all y'all that struggle with the things I don't struggle with, but we're all suckers for this. We're all trying to add to what Christ did for us. And I think the reason is because we're glory hounds, man. We love credit. We wanna be able to say, yeah, Jesus saved me and this is what I did. Isaiah 64, six, very famous verse says this, that we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments or filthy rags. It's not just that our sin is nasty before God, but even when we try to earn our salvation, I mean, this is, this is a crazy concept to try to get your mind around. That your works, the exact same work, could either be worship and glory to God, or it could be incredibly offensive to him. The, the, the real difference is why are you doing it? It's back to that order. Like, if you, were, if you were exceptionally generous tonight and you wrote the biggest check you've ever written in your life out of a sense of gratitude to God because he is first and he went first and he sent his son, therefore you're gonna bring your first and best to him, he is glorified in it. If you've got an interview tomorrow and you think somehow you can put him in your debt and he's gonna like sprinkle a little promotion dust on you because of what you did, it is offensive to him. You see the difference? It's all about the, the, the preeminence of Christ. And so there's a bunch of people that try to add stuff. There's a whole denomination that says it's faith plus baptism. That it's faith plus baptism. This is, this is from their doctrinal statement. Remissions of sins cannot be enjoyed by any person before immersion. Except for that thief on the cross. I don't know what they do about that. You know what they do about that? You have to create this whole hermeneutical gymnastic to get around why it didn't count for that guy. You know, or if you get saved in Antarctica and there's no water, you just <laughs> slam you into the ice until you go to heaven, I guess. I don't know what happens. <laughs> this is no gospel. Because what that is saying is, Christ took me almost there. He took me almost to the edge of heaven, but thankfully I was able to do the rest and do the physical act of being baptized. Now, should you get baptized as, you, as a believer? Yes, 100%. And we've got beach baptism coming up, and if you've never been baptized as a believer, Christ commanded it. But he commanded it as an outward and visible symbol of the reality that you've already been saved by grace through faith, by the finished work of Jesus. And you're gonna walk out in that ocean and we're gonna say, who is Jesus to you? And you're not going to say, he's a partner in my salvation and he got me here, but I'll take it from there. That's not what you're gonna say. If so, we're gonna be like, sorry, you can get out of here. You ain't getting baptized, man. We'll send you back to class because you weren't paying attention. You're gonna say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And because he lived was dead and buried and was resurrected from the grave, because he did that for me, 
I too am in him and I am dying to myself and I am being resurrected to a newness of life and then we're all gonna cheer, amen? But it ain't gonna save you. It's just a reality that you already are. There's some, there's some denominations that teach it's faith plus religious activity. How many of you grew up Catholic? Okay, get ready, here it comes. Okay. Now, before I get into it, you may say, well, are you saying all Catholics are going to hell? No. Anybody that puts their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and believes in the sufficiency of Christ's work on the cross is going to heaven. All Baptists ain't going to heaven either. You understand this? Here's the real shocker. All 1122ers ain't going to heaven. It's just, they ain't a Groupon for heaven. It's just you. Have you put your faith in Jesus? So, the two fundamental differences between a Protestant church like ours and the Catholic church is this. Number one is authority. We believe that the authority is the word of God. Catholic authority is like a three-legged stool. It's the Bible, the Pope, and church tradition or history. And so, Catholic doctrine says this. This is from the Council of Trent. This is their response to Martin Luther reading the book of Romans saying, the Bible teaches that salvation is by faith alone. Their response was, if anyone saith that man is truly absolved from his sins and justified because he has surely believed himself absolved and justified, or that no one is truly justified but he who believes himself justified, and that by this faith alone, absolution and justification are effected, let him be anathema or accursed. In other words, what they're saying is that what Christ did on the cross takes you almost there, but then you have a part to play too. And that, and that could be baptism, first communion, confirmation, confession, penance. You see, if you grew up Catholic, what the, what the Catholic doctrine is, is that when you participate in the sacraments, then grace is imparted to you. If you do your part, God will do his part. And you're trying to stay in a state of grace. And hopefully you're there when you die. That, there, that is not the gospel. One Catholic theologian, Ludwig Ott, if you're looking for baby names, Ludwig, it's maybe stay away from him. He says this, for the justified eternal life is both a gift of grace promised by God and a reward for his own good works and merits. This is not the gospel. That you are not imparted grace because of the good things you do. You are imputed with the righteousness of Christ for believing in his life and death, death and resurrection. Not to get ahead, but in Galatians 2.21, Paul says, I, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, a little closer to home. If you grew up Pentecostal, okay, which is a great place to find worship leaders. It's great. But there are some people that kind of teach this kind of hyper charismania that it's not faith alone, it's faith plus a particular gift of the Holy Spirit, particularly tongues. And if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved. That's not the gospel. There's not a certain gift or a certain sign that is required as proof of salvation. And what begins to happen is you begin to chase after a gift instead of the giver of the gifts. You begin to chase after an experience instead of experience the resurrected Christ. And it is no gospel at all. And interestingly enough, sometimes people will ask me, how come you don't talk about the Holy Spirit enough? I'm like, I talk to him. He doesn't want me to talk about him. The Holy Spirit always points everything to Jesus. Always, always. Now the gifts are good, they're just not for you. The gifts are for the glory of God and the edification of the church. And if you begin to take a good gift of God and elevate it to primary, that's a really, really bad thing. There are others. And this is kind of the pendulum swinging the other way. And it's not faith plus experience, but it's faith plus knowledge. And it's very dangerous. Because when you think that it's faith plus knowledge, like if you know the most about Jesus, then you're gonna be saved, what begins to happen is you begin to move away from the gospel. That you begin to treat the gospel like it's the ABCs, but in reality, the gospel is the A to Z. 
That the gospel's not like just the diving board that gets you in, it's the whole pool. It's not just the starter to get the engine going, it's the bumper to bumper, the whole thing. And if you think that, that the gospel is merely the entry, then what you'll try to do is like graduate to the deeper things, which will lead you to just be puffed up with knowledge. And in doing so, you will continue to move further and further and further away from the cross. We've talked about this illustration a number of times. There's a book called The Cross-Centered Life, and the guy draws this illustration. And, and it's like the timeline of your life, and then it's the moment that you get saved, that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And what happens in the life of the believer after you surrender your life is two things simultaneously happen. I talk about this all the time. One is our understanding of the glory and magnificence of God grows higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. Simultaneously, our understanding of our own sinfulness and depravity grows deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the gap, the chasm between us, an unholy person, and a holy, righteous God gets bigger and bigger and bigger in this illustration. And the only thing that can, that can fill that in growing chasm is our ever-increasing understanding of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we think it's just our understanding that does it, then there's a gap there, and we think we fill in that gap. There's also, this has been very popular in the last 20 years or so. There's some people that say, well, it's kind of faith plus helpful tips. Like you show up to church and you know, it's kind of Christian karaoke and a TED talk with several Bible verses. And it has nothing to do with the life, death, resurrection of Christ, the reality that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God, that we deserve destruction, and Christ came on a rescue mission, a prisoner exchange. Instead, it's like, hey, let me tell you 12 ways to not be in debt. There's no gospel, man. There's no gospel there at all. Now these days, there's some people that say, you don't have to have faith at all. That it actually works without faith. Kind of doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe like with passion. It's not the object of your faith, but it's like the intensity of your faith. And the way that plays out is if you're just, you know, pretty loving and a good person. This is the progressive church, the woke church. That's called lost, by the way. Because if, because if good people get to go to heaven, what are we gonna do? Because I don't know about you, I know fully I am not good. You see, here's, here's the problem. When you begin to try to use the gospel as a means to your political end, that is no gospel at all. Should we serve people? You better believe it. There, there are serious symptoms of the gospel-infected life but don't get this out of order. There are some people that call themselves a church and they do not submit themselves to the word of God. They stand in judgment over God and they tell him who they are. Instead of receiving from God their creator and saying, I am going to submit and to surrender to you. Now, while it's easy to beat up on all those people out there, let me give you this one. Faith plus 1122 will send you to hell. Okay, this matters a lot, man. Because if you come here, you're gonna hear some very clear directives about taking steps of discipleship. Please, please, please don't ever get this out of order. Sponsoring a kid won't save you. Being in a disciple group won't save you. Going on a mission trip won't save you. Worshiping with your hands up won't save you. And be very, very careful to not judge other people's relationship with Jesus based on your own motive, emotive response. I am very guilty of this. I sit over here, I sing all the songs. I sing with hands up, tears down, baby. I do, I can't help it, I can't help it. I'm moved by Luke 15 when the dad runs to his son and wraps his arms around him and fills his face with kisses, right? I'm moved when he goes out and he entreats his younger son, won't you come? I'm moved when Mary walks into the room and busts open the jar of ointment, the whole, it, like it changes the atmosphere. And I'm like, how can you, if you love Jesus, how can you not just go for it? I've seen you at the Jags games. You don't go like, Okay, however, a type and style of worship is not a prerequisite to salvation. Amen. It's a result of it, so be very, very careful that you, don't, that, you, that you keep the order right because any time we try to add anything to Jesus 
in regards to salvation, we ruin everything. We ruin everything. Um, I'm usually not really good with like relevant illustrations. But the solar eclipse happened on Monday. Was it Monday? I don't know. I was thoroughly disappointed. <laughs> I don't know what I, I didn't have like the glasses. I was just, I thought it was gonna be awesome. And uh, I was in the turkey woods in Woodbine, Georgia, and it just looked like a cloud pass. And I thought, huh, Keith, I thought the turkeys would start gobbling again. I was gonna shoot one in the face to the glory of God. But, <laughs> but I did see some of the pictures. And those of you that had the glasses, first of all, you look like, I don't, why would you post a picture of you doing that on your own Instagram, okay? So you look ridiculous. No. I want you to think about what the solar eclipse is, right? The moon has no source of light in and of itself. All it can do is reflect the light. And as far as we're concerned down here, I know it's got stuff to do with tides and all that, but as far as we're concerned, its job is to simply reflect the light of the sun to the earth. That's what it does. And the sun is the source of energy and light. And then, have you ever noticed this too? Every time it happens, it's like once in a lifetime. I've seen, it's been like five times in my lifetime. So anyway, the Weather Channel may be overplaying their hand a little bit, right? Storm of the century again this month. But anyway. But when the moon gets in the way, puts itself in between the earth and the sun, that's a dark way to live. That's what workspace righteousness is. See, as believers, because of the light of the Son of God in our lives, we are to reflect that light and do all kind of good things. But if you think the good things are a source of salvation in and of yourself, it is like you stand in front of the cross and nobody can see it because you're trying to make much of yourself and that is darkness. That's what it is. So regarding our salvation, Jesus plus anything ruins everything. And here's what I want you to see about all the examples that I used. Is that this distortion or this twist, it starts with a good thing. Like to all you Southern Baptists, or, or what's funny, some of you grew up like independent fundamentalist Baptists and you thought the Southern Baptists were liberal. Ha! <laughs> Holy living is a good thing. It is a very good thing. Guardrails in your life for you and me are a good thing. Walking in wisdom because you know this thing in and of itself might not be sin, but it might lead me to sin. Therefore, you decide to avoid it. That's a good thing. I'm talking about beer, just in case you haven't figured that out, okay? It's a good thing to do. But when you begin to require what is wisdom for you to be salvific from some, for somebody else, that is not the gospel. Dr. John Piper, smartest guy alive, one of the best preachers ever, who is a teetotaler, which means he's never had alcohol and he doesn't drink alcohol at all. And I'm preaching with him next week, so that should be a doozy. He says this, legalism has sent more people to hell than alcoholism or any other addiction ever has. It's a fact, man. So again, holy living is a good thing when you try to apply wisdom in your life as salvific in other people's life, it's a, that's not good. Baptism is a good thing. It just won't save you. If you're saved, you should get baptized on May 5th and it will not save you. Religious activity is a good thing. It is good to do things that cultivate your relationship with Jesus, like prayer and confession and worship and taking of the sacraments. These are good things. Liturgy is a good thing because it keeps your, your eyes and your heart focused on Jesus instead of the people on stage all the time. These are good things. But when you say these religious activities are required to be saved, that is no gospel at all. The gifts of the Spirit are a good thing. The Bible is very, very clear that we should seek these gifts. We should figure out what gift you have. Every single believer in Jesus has at least one spiritual gift and no believer has all of them. Therefore, we need each other like your body needs all your body parts. But the reason that we seek the gifts of God are for the glory of God, not you, and the edification of the church, not you. Knowledge is a good thing as a means to see God more clearly, not look down your nose at somebody else that doesn't know as much as you. Loving people just as they are is a good, good thing. Amen. Leaving them in their sin and calling it good is evil and is not love, love whatsoever. Justice is a good thing. 
If you're a believer in Jesus, we are called and commanded to demonstrate the gospel because we have experienced the gospel. But if you get those things out of order and think your demonstration of justice justifies you, then what you're doing is looking at Christ on the cross and saying that wasn't enough. At 11.22, taking steps in the direction of the good shepherd, the discipleship journey, it's a good thing. But none of those things will save you. What saves you is when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. He finishes it this way. He says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed, anathema, damned to hell. You see, it's not enough to just believe that the gospel is true. It must be received. My question for you is this, have you received the gospel? Martin Luther says it this way, he wrote this commentary on the book of Galatians. You have to have a thesaurus to understand it, but it's pretty awesome. He says, for there is no middle ground between Christian righteousness and works righteousness. There is no alternative to Christian righteousness but works righteousness. If you do not build your confidence on the work of Christ, you must build your confidence on your own work. This is why Paul says, if anyone is preaching a gospel contrary to the one you received, that the gospel is the off, offer by grace of a free gift of salvation to you. So to illustrate, I got a gift. Somebody bring me the gift. Give it up for the guy that probably never wanted to be seen on stage. What's up, man? Thank you. All right. This is a gift. It's a Tiffany's box, because I'm a baller, all right? So, not really. What do you do to earn a gift? The moment you earn it, it's a wage. It's not a gift. Have you ever gotten your paycheck and go to your boss and be like, I just wanna thank you so much for the incredible gift? No. You're like, I earned every dime of this, and now it's worth many less dimes than it was, but whatever, that's a different sermon. So, it's a gift, man, it's a gift. Now, if somebody gives you a gift, but you don't receive it, do you have the gift? What do you have to do is you have to receive it. You have to unwrap it, you have to open it. This is your response. That right now, right where you are, right when you are, Jesus Christ is offering to you the free gift of salvation that when he died on the cross and said, it is finished, he says, that's for you. I'm calling you. And if you will receive this, then you will be called a son or a daughter of God. You'll get saved. Have you ever received that gift? Now, the reality is this isn't actually a gift. This is a trophy, okay? This is the first place trophy of the Tim Tebow Celebrity Golf Tournament right here. This is what you get if you get first. <laughs> Just want y'all to see, it is master, so I'm two for two on relevant illustrations. <laughs> this is what it looks like. If you're a winner, this is what you get. Now, and it too is a picture of the good news of the gospel. And you may be like, well pastor, how could that be? Because you just said that you don't do anything to earn it, and obviously you were part of earning this first place trophy for the Tim Tebow Celebrity Golf Tournament, okay? <laughs> Let me give you a little example. Let me, any golfers in the house? Got any golfers here? Okay, good, all right. You came tonight so you could, be, you could watch on Sunday, didn't you? I know you, all right, so anyway. <laughs> we'll talk about idolatry later, so anyway, so. Here's the thing about this, it was a scramble. This is my favorite way to play. For those of you that don't know what it is, it's like, we had five people. Doug Flutie was on my team. That's pretty cool. Remember Flutie Flakes? He's a baller, man. He's a clutch. He's awesome. He's that tall. Anyway, he's awesome. <laughs> so the way a scramble works, just in case you don't know, everybody hits their shot, and then you go and pick the best shot, and then you just play it. So then everybody hits their second shot. You do it again and again and again for 18 holes, and we do this at TPC Sawgrass. So here's the thing. I won the first place trophy. I'm almost positive we used zero of my shots. <laughs> One time it was this far away and they let me tap it in just to be like, because I did drive the cart, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> and if you were to say, well, how is this a picture of the gospel? So when you, play, when you play at TPC Sawgrass, what's the only question you get? 
what'd you do on 17? Okay, I get up there on 17, and I don't really get nervous in front of people. That's, I mean, I'm kind of used to it. And I get up there, and I'm like, I can't breathe. I'm, okay. And I take two clubs. If you ever walk up there with two clubs, it's already over, man. You don't know what you're doing, okay? <laughs> and I swing as hard as I can, because that's good. You might as well swing as hard as you can in case you run into it. You never know what might happen, okay? Golf is a brutal game. The harder you try, the worse you are. It's terrible. Nobody's even trying to stop you. You want to feel like a failure? Be a golfer. Okay, so. And dude, I duffed this thing so I hadn't hit a bad one like this. And I mean, it go, it's like it would have landed on you. It's so bad. And as soon as I duff it over there, Doug Flutie tosses me a Hail Mary. And he's like, here you go, try it again. Well, in golf, you don't get to try it again. But I, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I play by grace, not by faith. Like the law has nothing to do with it. I hit them till I like them, count them, most of them. Okay. So I hit my second one in the water. In the water, I'm like, no, it's all that matters. My partner gets up there. I played with Big Mac, a guy named Jamie, and a dude named Andrew, who's like 25 years old. I met him about three weeks ago in the lobby. He just started coming here. I said, what do you do for a living? He goes, I'm trying to get my tour card. I go, what you doing in three weeks? I know what you're doing. You're gonna join my team. He's amazing. Not pretty good, he is, I'm like, how have you not won the Masters eight times? Holy moly, I've never seen somebody hit it like this. He's striping the way, it's incredible. So he's, oh, I think Big Mac on this one, stands up, poop, right in the middle of 17, we tap it in for birdie, we write down birdie. I go to 18, and I hit one as good as I can hit it. Now, here's the thing, if you're a golfer, if your slice lands in the fairway, they call it a fade, I don't know if you know this, and I hit it as hard as I could, as far, it was so good that when I hit that thing, I took my club and I flipped it like a baseball player. You don't even do that in golf, that's what I do though, okay? So we didn't use my bad one on 17, and then I've hit the best one I've ever hit all day. I mean, I smoked it, it was awesome. And then my teammate Andrew gets up, actually all three other people hit it better than me. What, like Andrew's was still going up when it looked down at mine, it's like, hey little guy, and just <laughs> kept going. So not only, we didn't, we didn't use my bad ones or my good ones. And at the end of the round, with all my bad shots and even some of my okay ones, I have a scorecard and our team has a scorecard. And we use his scorecard. And based on his scorecard, I have a first place trophy. <laughs> so, listen, man, that's the gospel. I'm telling you, that is the gospel. There will come a day where you will stand before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the first time, man, he came in grace. When he comes back, next time you see him, it will be in judgment. Amen. And you got one of two options. You can say, here's my scorecard. And you will be judged accordingly. And I'm telling you, it will not be enough and you will spend forever separated from him paying for it. But by the grace of God, Jesus, the Christ, who is perfect, just says, you wanna use mine? You wanna use mine? How would you like to get credit for what I have done on your behalf? Here, I invite you to receive the free gift of my grace through his life, death, and resurrection. Have you ever received that? Not just believe that it's true, but personally, just like Paul says, he called you. Maybe right now he's calling you. And, and in our time together, right now, you are ready to receive the free gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That if you'll admit it, I ain't got this. And you believe when Christ died on the cross that that counted for you, then right this moment you could receive the right to be called a son or a daughter of God. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And if that's it, man, if you were ready to receive the good news of Jesus, that when he died on the cross, somehow it counted for you, if you are ready to confess him as your Lord and Savior, then right where you are right now, in the greatest exchange of all time, you are ready to receive the free gift of salvation. Would you lift your hand as high as you can? 
The Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. If for the first time you are ready, then join the dozens of people in this room right now and lift your hand and say, Father, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Our good and gracious heavenly Father, God, we love you more than anything because you first loved us. And God, I thank you and I praise you for the gospel. God, would you, would you please give us a supernatural warning that we may never try to add our own works to your finished work. God, I thank you and I praise you that even right now in your house that there is salvation. Even in this very moment, there are men, there are women, there are students who are being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, God. That they are being delivered, that they are being rescued from themselves, rescued from their sin. And God, for all of us that have been following after you for a minute, God, would you just remind us that we never graduate from the gospel. May we never get over the truth of the gospel, that you loved us, you redeemed us, you've rescued us, you've delivered us, all for the glory of God. And for that, God, we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Folks, we believe that the gospel demands a response. Would you please stand to your feet as we respond? We're gonna sing. We're gonna lift our voices to the one who is worthy of our song. That's what worship is. We're gonna bring our tithes and our offerings not to pay off God to try to get, it, get him in our debt, not to tip God because we just showed up and we're entertained, but because he is first in our life as an act of worship, we're gonna bring our first and best. And we're gonna pray. We're gonna come and kneel before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who through the blood of Jesus Christ has invited us to cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. Let's sing, let's bring, let's pray, let's respond.
joy of my salvation should be my final Church, aren't you thankful that it is finished? No more debt we owe. Church, let's celebrate with the 21 men and women in all of our campuses and online tonight that tonight was the night that it was finished. Listen, if that was you, Pastor Jovi and I will be in the lobby. We would love to hug you, welcome you to the family, and then point you to the Connect Center to get signed up to get baptized. The men and women out there would love to help you take that step of faith because it is finished. Amen? Church, we love you like crazy. We can't wait to worship with you next week. Be free.